Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the third regional webinar in the series on urban food justice, exploring the principles and practice of food justice in urban contexts across the world. We had the first uh, webinar um, back in uh, December, focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. We had another, the second one last month that looked at North America and Latin America. And this is the third looking at the region, at the Asia and Pacific region. Um, and we will, we're glad to have you here. There are people joining as I speak, I see. And uh, you're welcome. We, just a few housekeeping announcements. First, feel free to, to put your name and your affiliation in the chat. Uh, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. And later on, as you think through some of your questions, please drop those in the Q&A uh, window and they will be picked up or we will try to pick them up at the end uh, of the session. Um, this is a partnership between uh, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, MUFPP, uh, the Food Foundation and Birmingham City Council. And it's been a, uh, initiative with a series of activities over the last, uh, well, over at least a year um, um, or, or longer. And this particular year is part of a fellowship program in which we are running webinars such as this, in which we are setting up uh, resources, including a, um, a food justice, uh, sorry, food justice toolkit, which uh, Leticia will introduce later on. Uh, there has been a global food justice pledge, which you will hear more about in addition to hearing about the MUFPP and the project experiences from the region, along with regional expertise. So the structure of the uh, session is, first, we'll hear from Leticia Petrovich from Food Foundation, who will uh, introduce uh, perspectives and, and the origins of the initiative from her side, followed shortly by uh, Filippo Gavazzini from the MUFPP, who will talk about the broader initiative, uh, the Milan Initiative, and then we will move into the second uh, session where we explore uh, perspectives and experiences from uh, the partner, partner cities. Uh, so we have Sukabumi from Indonesia with Pak Tendi Satandi, who will talk about the experience there, followed by uh, Shweta Kandelwal from New Delhi and Nick Rose from uh, Australia. So we'll go straight into it, I think. I think we have... Uh, uh, a good group of people here together. So I would like to ask uh, Leticia, if you'd like to introduce uh, from the Food Foundation side, please, Leticia. Great, thank you very much, Stuart, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who's joining us all around the world. I'm really pleased to be here again. As Stuart mentioned, this is our third webinar in the series of three, looking at um, perspectives and exploring perspectives on food justice across all of the um, MUFPP regions. And I'm just going to provide a little bit of a context to this exciting learning opportunity. And then in the later part of the session, I will also do a quick demo of the Food Justice Toolkit, which hopefully all of you will be able to use and utilize in your cities and localities. So um, as Stuart already mentioned, I work for the Food Foundation, which is the organization based in the UK, which basically um, works with number of stakeholders, including policymakers, businesses and retailers to try and make our food environments healthier, better and more accessible. And the this exciting learning opportunity follows on from the launch of the Global Food Cities Pledge um, that Birmingham City Council, who I've been working very closely with over the last year, launched in 2021 at the MUFPP annual gathering. And what this pledge really recognizes is that access to healthy food is a basic human right. And cities who are committed to pledge and to be part of this community seek to really address the systemic inequalities in the food system that we know contribute to food insecurity and, and poor nutrition, especially affecting those in marginalized communities. 
And the reason why Birmingham was so keen to start this conversation was uh, the experience of the COVID pandemic, which really shown a harsh light um, on the fragility of food security within urban cities like Birmingham, and which exacerbated some of those existing inequalities in, in many communities. But I think it's important to mention that we are extremely lucky to be working in a city where our politicians and leaders really understand the importance of food to our city and that it's not just important for, for health, it's important for our economy and it's important for our sense of identity. So this Food Justice Pledge came out of a series of conversations that um, we as a city had during COVID pandemic, where we were sharing with other cities across the world how difficult it was to um, feed people and how challenging it was, not just because what was going on in our cities, um, but in a, but also this was a kind of a global conversation. And we wanted this to be the vehicle for which we can talk to and engage with cities in this space. So really recognizing that food justice is a global issue, which is why we, we're doing this series of webinar, looking at all of the different regional perspectives, um, whether you're a high income or low income country, um, whether you're a city that is saturated by fast food or um, there's a lot of food deserts, food security is now an issue for every citizen across the world. And that's where this pledge and this commitment is really coming from. And we in, in Birmingham and in UK still have a lot of work to do. Um, in Birmingham, for example, last year we have seen a huge increase of 42% in number of people who have needed to use a food bank, um, which is obviously quite a devastating, devastating um, stats. And we really kind of know that there is much more work to be done. And what we've learned through this series is there is so many good examples and practices across the world that we can learn from. So we want this to be a continuation of that conversation and engagement with other signatory cities and, and localities that um, have had experience and that have tackled this, this issue. Mm -hmm. And we also want um, to bring the practitioners and experts on this topic globally in an effort to continue to drive this necessary change. And we hope that Birmingham Food Justice Pledge is a living example of this collective effort of cities to be at the forefront of change in our food system. So we're very much looking forward to seeing this movement grow and getting more and more cities signing up to the pledge. And I'll pop the link to the pledge and all of the resources in the in the chat as we go along. Uh, but for now, thank you very much for joining and I'll pass on back to Stuart. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Leticia. Um, excellent. I would like to hand over to uh, uh, Filippo Gavazzini from the MUFPP, uh, who will provide a perspective of the initiative overall. Over to you, Filippo. Thank you, Stuart and, and Letizia. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Also in this webinar uh, devoted to um, uh, raise the issue of um, um, of food justice and uh, and promote the use of uh, of the toolkit also in uh, in Eurasia and also in, in in Asia Pacific. We are very happy about the work that we have we have been doing together within the the, the fellowship program. Uh, I will briefly start with um, a presentation of the pact because there might be uh, officers and cities that are not uh, familiar with it. So I will uh, kindly ask if you can share the presentation for me. In the meantime. Um, I will I will I will start uh, speaking about uh, the Milan Pact, which is uh, the first uh, global commitment of mayors that see food as an entry point uh, for sustainable development of growing cities. The pact was born in 2015 uh, with the first cohort of uh, 100 mayor uh, mayors within the Expo Milano, and. Uh, it's a platform that uh, uh, has established 37 recommended actions that are clustered in six categories, the one that you can see here in the slide. And the idea is to cover all the, let's say, the, the, the urban food system. So every city can choose um, one or more recommended action depending on the political priority and on uh, the uh, local uh, environment. 
Mm, so we have from governance, the adoption, uh, for example, of, of a food strategy. And this is one of the cases that I will, uh, um, that I will talk about later. Sustainable diets and nutrition, for example, uh, dietary guidelines uh, or um, uh, school canteens, social and economic equity provide healthy access to all citizens uh, uh, with a specific uh, reference to the people in need. Food production, so urban rural and, uh, and uh, rural and urban connections and uh, uh, the um, urban farming or in general agriculture. Food supply and distribution, so the logistic of food markets, wholesale market, and also food waste prevention. Uh, I see the, my presentation is uh, appearing and disappearing continuously. I don't know if you want, I can share the screen. Um, so uh, I, I'm not seeing the presentation now. I don't know if you two yeah. was OK. Uh, yes, I don't know what's happening. Uh, Leticia, do you know? Yeah, why sorry. I'm not operating the slides. Yeah, I'm um, operating the slides. It looks like it's coming up and then coming down. So I'm just going to try and share once again. If not, Filippo will ask you to share your own slides. So I'm just going to try and uh, share my slides again quickly. Okay. Okay, so in the meantime, I will I will <clears throat> I will continue with the third slide, which uh, um, um, which is talking about the the governance system of the Milan Roma Food Policy Pact. So the mayor of Milan is permanent chair, and then every two years uh, we have elections for rep the representation of the um, um, steering committee, and uh, we we have let's say quite a new steering committee. Uh, two representative for um, okay that that's the one oh, no, it's, I know I will share I will share yes please sorry I'm not sure okay. why it's disappearing it's okay, no worries. <clears throat> okay please tell me when you see you can see it. <clears throat> I think you can see it now, right? Uh, yes. Perfect. Okay. So, okay. So this is an overview of the Milan Pact. Uh, we have uh, quite eight, quite nine years of activities, more than 280 mayors uh, from all around the world. You can see in the map that signed the pact, uh, representing more than 80 countries. Uh, in, in these years, we have organized many global forum and uh, global fora and regional forum in the different regions. And I was mentioning about the, the steering committee of the pact. So we have uh, uh, two uh, representatives uh, for each region that uh, have the, let's say, the honor and the um, responsibility to um, let's say, create a, a, an agenda uh, at a regional level and represent the, the members at a, at a global one and uh, organize a series of activities uh, consistent with the, the leaders, the regional leadership plan. So, well, for, for Europe, uh, we have Barcelona, Birmingham, of course, and, uh, and Milan, while for Eurasia, we have Ankara and uh, Jabalpur. And for Asia Pacific, we have Seoul and uh, and uh, the city of uh, Bandung. Uh, this is the the set of the seven recommended action that are have just mentioned, with some concrete example of uh, of policies that cities can uh, can undertake. And uh, connected to this recommended action, uh, we have de uh, developed a monitoring framework together with uh, FAO and RUAF uh, that is very. Uh, important because give the, the the possibility to cities to monitor to assess the impact of uh, food policies directly connected with the recommended action and with the SDGs. Uh, so I invite you to have a look uh, to <clears throat> to the forty four indicators that can provide use useful tools to to monitor the 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 impact of uh, of of the food policies. 
Um, so, well, this is an overview of uh, Asia, the Asia Pacific region. We have 34 cities uh, and Bandung and Seoul playing a primary role in the steering committee. Uh, then uh, <clears throat> we have uh, um, um, one winner of the, of the 2022 ed edition of the Milan Pact Awards, which is the city of Yosu, and also another winner, which is uh, um, uh, the city of Bandung with the program Burwan Sai on urban agriculture. For uh, um, Eurasia, we have 30, 31 cities and uh, um, um, Istanbul and Jabalpur, again, as I mentioned, uh, playing a primary role for the region, regionalization of the Milan Pact in the region. And then we have uh, one winner, which is uh, um, um, the city of Kazan for, uh, let's say, school canteens. I mentioned the Milan Pact Awards. So the Milan Pact Awards is an initiative that we launched in 2016. And year by year, we have been collecting by our signatory cities uh, um, their best practices. Now uh, we have uh, the, let's say, most important uh, um, library of food policy knowledge that is at the, let's say, at the, it's the pillar for the city to city <clears throat> exchange. Uh, of knowledge and it's let's say at the, put at the service of all signatory cities you can see uh, that uh, uh, we have a majority of uh, best practices coming uh, from um, sustainable diets and nutrition so providing healthy diets to citizens and the second most participated is governance so the adoption for example of food strategy the creation of food councils let me um uh, give you an overview of the um, winning cities of uh, uh, winning city of uh, uh, to the 2022 edition, which is the city of Rourkela in India with the project Equal Mandi, uh, which has created uh, well they they have quite an important problem. So the uh, from one side food safety in mark in wholesale markets uh, and let's say the, the um, um uh, because there was not 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 present the facilities uh, to store uh in cool rooms uh the um, fruit and vegetables and uh and this also created a, an important food food um, amount of food waste so this this in this slide you can see the the, the overall number of um, uh, fruit and vegetable that is wasted uh, mainly to the lack of post uh, storage facility so around 34% uh, and 44% uh, fruit among fruit and vegetable and then so equal mandi has installed five solar energy based decentralized cold storage in five markets in the city uh, that can um from which can be benefited by uh, more than uh, uh, 1,500 vendors that then can store their, their produce. The uh, peculiar thing is that um, the who, who is running this, uh, let's say, these services, uh, um, uh, let's say, organization made only by women. Um, and this is also important because they empower uh, women in this very central aspect uh, of uh, of food storage in um, in in markets then we have another practice that we want to to show which is connected of course to the to this to, to the topic of today which is the city of melbourne um uh, with uh, so it's a special mention um with uh, um uh, that has presented uh, um the the problem of uh, food insecurity which is uh, increasingly uh, um, hitting the city and their citizens after the covid pandemic pandemic in, in indeed uh, one out three residents were experiencing food insecurity and uh, uh, 7.5 percent increase in people reporting food insecurity in the city among 2019 and 2021 and uh, so the the city decided to include uh food security as a, a key health and well-being focus area uh, within the council plan uh, the, the five-year council plan uh, that will end in 2020 five in order to develop a set of initiatives uh, providing food relief to vulnerable members of the community if you want to know more uh, you can well you have the link but uh, you can download uh, the report 
uh, of the Milan Pact Award 2022. Uh, here from uh, uh, from the uh, the QR code, you can see also in the in the graph in the in the left uh, the well uh, the recommended action in the inner circle and. Uh, um, the special mention with the star and the winning and 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 also um the winning cities um finally uh, the milan pact uh, is let's say conducted by the milan the milan pact secretariat which uh, continuously aim to supporting cities uh, uh, to uh, through webinars like the one today, uh, meetings, field visit, uh, advocacy action act, uh, activities of uh, um, organization of uh, of event. Uh, so, if you want to sign the pact uh, for for officers that are not yet part of it. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, there's just the need of a letter of commitment signed by the mayor. Uh, there are no uh, um, bounding rules, let's say, or budget requirements. So there are no fees to join, but there, there is the need, let's say, the willingness of be proactive in transforming that food system. That means share what you, what you, your best practices, but at the same time, eager to learn from other cities and the Milan Park Secretariat will, will support uh, those city, the, the cities in, um, in this effort. So you want to know more, uh, you can contact the Secretariat. Uh, to conclude, this is uh, just an overview of the activity of the fellowship program and uh, an important part of it is, is conducted uh, on food justice with the uh, um, uh, with the with the food foundation and you can see you can have an example of the of the first month of the fellowship program uh, with the secretariat tried to connect the different cities and the learning needs uh, with uh, uh, the different uh, the different stakeholder uh, thank you for your attention i'm very happy to have uh, uh, an amazing uh, um, uh, best practices coming from sukabumi which i had the pleasure to to visit firsthand so i'm, I'm very happy uh, to learn uh, the, the advancement uh, from a and Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe. It's fantastic to have that insight into such an important initiative overall, especially, I think, now, in as much as we are learning. We're learning so much from cities and muni municipalities uh, that I think national governments can take a lot of lessons from that. And, and in terms of uh, the whole issue of scale across across uh, countries. Um, I'm just checking with uh, Leticia uh, uh, because we had a bit of a glitch with the technology. Um, has that been resolved, Leticia? Are you able to confirm it's okay now to go ahead? Okay. Um, all right, I can't hear Leticia. Hi, um, I'm just sharing the screen. Hopefully you can see it, but please yeah. let me know yeah. if that that you can't, if you can't see it. Great, yes, we can okay, see it. I think, all right, I think we've got it, good. So we're gonna move into the next uh, se segment of the agenda where we will hear from different experiences uh, across the region. And we will start in Indonesia, Sukabumi, uh, the One Region, One Uptaker program, which is part of the MUFPP uh, network and initiative. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Pak Tendi Satandi, who will introduce the initiative. Over to you, uh, Pak Tendi. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, NWAPP, uh, Filippo, and then uh, Food uh, Foundation, and Stuart, and Natisha for organizing such a wonderful uh, webinar. Uh, let me introduce uh, Marcep. My name is Tandi Sitandi. I am a policy analyst in the Department of Food Security, Agriculture, and Municipal uh, uh, First of all, uh, Skabumi is a small city uh, between two mega urban uh, Jakarta as the capital city of Indonesia and Bandung, the capital city of province, uh, West Java province. And we are surrounded by uh, food producer agencies uh, such as Sukabumi, Sianjur, and Boko Regency. And Sukabumi City uh, serves as a center of pork collection and distribution of goods and services 
from some uh, from surrounding area and one of the master activity center in West Java province uh, in West Java province. We are uh, focusing uh, mainly our sector is uh, uh, services, uh, education, and tourism. But uh, uh, the agriculture is our main concern too. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next. Uh, this colony is a small city. It's only 48 kilometers per square and consists of seven districts and 33 sub-districts. The total population is uh, 350,000 people. And our uh, agricultural land is, is still quite uh, large for a city, uh, 1.3 thousand hectares, and mostly for production of paddy. And uh, this kind of crop is a horticultural product, such as vegetables and uh, medicinal and ornamental plants. And our production for rice is around uh, 20,000 grain uh, ton per year per grain or equivalent to uh, 10,000 or 12,000 uh, 12, uh, uh, ton of rice. Uh, but the, the production is only uh, fulfill the 30% of the needs of rice in Skabung City. Next. <clears throat> Next. Uh, maybe the challenge in the food justice in this economy is first uh, this climate change the affect the food production in Indonesia. In the last uh, uh, early now in the October uh, to December, uh, reduce the paddy plantation around one uh, one point two million uh, hectares. So it's it's cost a lot of uh, the production in Indonesia. As a result. Now the price of the rice in in, in mostly in the uh, area in Indonesia is uh, uh, high high. Uh, it's increased uh, more than twenty percent in the last in the last month. And then uh, another challenge is a massive conversion uh, agricultural land in Sukabumi. Uh, in the last ten year we. The decrease average of 2.2 percent per year, and like I said before, that this economy is highly dependent on food supply from the other regions. So, uh, we are very vulnerable to food inflation. Next, <clears throat> so what uh, the strategy to address food justice in this economy? There, there are three uh, uh, strategy. First of all, uh, preparing the regulation. And then uh, building the collaboration and uh, building uh, innovation in uh, food uh, strategy. Uh, for regulation, we, we already have a regional regulation about food management and uh, sustainable food agriculture land. And yeah, of course, we call uh, we building collaboration between government and community, community, private sector, and media, and then the innovation. And one of the innovation that we uh, we promote in the in uh, in Skowmi is uh, one group, one region, one Africa. Next, <clears throat> so what is one group, uh, one region of Africa? Is a government policy to maintain food supply through improving farmer welfare. If uh, I can uh, picture the 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 market of uh, grain, uh, paddy grain in uh, in farmer level in Sukabumi, uh, farmer are very dependent uh, to the middleman or middleman or we call it tengkula. So because the tengkula, uh, the middleman uh, who buy the grain from the farmers, uh, usually give them a uh, uh, brand uh, of a. Uh, capital for the production of uh, uh, of the paddy so the middleman has a very strong uh, power to control the market of the paddy grain in the farmer level they can uh, buy the uh, grain uh, below the market level 
So what we do is we are, we appointed a, a optaker. Optaker is from the it can be from the private or from the uh, farmer association to become the middleman in uh, in the farmer level. So the optaker uh, uh, help the farmer start from the funding for financing the uh, cost of production and and the market itself. So the grain from the farmer must be sell to the optaker with the price uh, rational price uh, mostly uh, with higher price uh, around uh, two and five percent uh, with the market level. With with the optaker, uh, we initiated in September twenty twenty. We start with uh, only ten uh, uh, farmers and with one optaker. Now we have uh, three optaker with and with around uh, cover the four hundred and fifty farmers. Next. <clears throat> So, what uh, the one row conversion of one optaker like would look like uh, that the optaker we government facilitate uh, the optaker and the farmer to form a contractual uh, agreement between the optaker and the farmer, and then so the optaker can provide the financing for uh seed, uh, fertilizer, and other component to need by the, the farmer uh, with no, uh, with no, uh, <clears throat> with no obligation to, with, uh, with no obligation to, what we call when we, uh, and then uh, the farmer should, could sell the grain to the optaker uh, with the high price, uh, mostly uh, five uh, two and five percent high higher than the market price. So and the farmer who join the program, we we persuade to join the uh, sustainable agriculture uh, and so. So we can uh, subsidize the farmer who uh, join the sustainable agriculture land uh, with uh, seed and uh, and then uh, fertilizer. Next. <clears throat> so the beneficiaries from uh, this program is the, the uh, all all the. Uh, stakeholder who involved in this program uh, for farmers they have a uh, financing the for the price production uh, cost and then uh, the guarantee for market for the grain they produce and get the reasonable price from the optaker and for us for government that of course we want to improve the, we want to keep the uh Paddy land in Skabumi through the program Sustainable Food Land. Uh, and of course, with keeping the paddy land, we guarantee the food uh, availability in Skabumi through production. And then for Apotekar, uh, the beneficiaries, the beneficiaries, it's benefit from the, they got uh, the product from the farmers and get the priority in municipality food programs. Next, um, I think we need to move move on a little. Are, are you close to completing? Yeah, next. I think I think this is the progress I put uh, in uh, Pandrup. We are very pleased that uh, improve in number of farmers, uh, especially for uh, number of farmers who join the sustainable agriculture land. Uh, we are very pleased that the participation is very high in uh, for the farmers. Next, next, please. So better uh, progress. Uh, we are we are improving the scale of the program, on number of farmer, taker, and products, and then we we currently uh, working on implementing the one group in particular product uh, for onion, and then uh, uh, giving incentive for the sustainable agriculture land. Next. <clears throat> 
So maybe I want to point out what SCOMI food management strategy is to ensure that every citizen of SCOMI city has access to quality and affordable food. And it's uh, contain a uh, three main category: uh, food availability, food accessibility, and food utilization. Next. So, in the practices in full, to fulfill the food availability in Stomi, uh, one group is one of them, and then we. We developed uh, udon farming through the art farming culture in home, and then animal feed management training, and then uh, uh, increased production piece, and then food processing to increase the added value of agricultural product. Next. And for accessibility, uh, we aim to equitable access to food for the community through. Uh, we are we have a program, the mobile check food market to for inflation. Uh, when uh, when there is an inflation uh inflation of food, we we have a, a pre a food chip market, and then uh regional government food reserve for for disaster, and then we develop the uh, information system for uh, foods and then next and for you to put utilization we we focus on consumption education and waste management uh, consumption uh, healthy food and food aid for stunting and for families and for education we educate for school children and for waste management we we promote the zero food loss and waste campaign Next, maybe I think it's what I can uh, share from Skabumi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank Andy. you. That was really fascinating insight into into Sukabumi experience and your work. I'm sorry for the inter interruption. We have a packed program of a lot to get through, but that was great to have your have your insights. I uh, will move straight on to. Uh, Dr. Shweta Kandelwal, who uh, I was pleased to have worked with in the past uh, in nutrition. Uh, Shweta is a senior advisor on nutrition at the JH Piego program in uh, India. Over to you, Shweta. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiburton, and greetings to everyone. So, um, without taking much time, but just to set the tone, uh, I think what my previous speaker was doing is explain one particular program. But what I will be doing in the next five or 10 minutes is to be able to give you a bird's eye view of what the Indian urban poor are doing in terms of their nutrition and diet. So it's a more, um, you know, it's not a granular piece of analysis, but at least some big pieces of where we are in terms of what they are eating, why they are facing these uh, challenges, uh, which I will describe in just a minute, and so on and so forth. Next, please. So let's kick off seeing what is the size of the problem that that we are talking about. Um, and when we talk about the urban population in India, it's very chunky. So we have about 36% of our, uh, that's the current statistics, uh, people living in the urban population. And if you see the chart on the right, it also shows an increasing trend. 50% of our Asian population is now urban. Next, please. Here are some uh, interesting statistics, which uh, I'm sure these will be shared with you. Uh, for the lack of time, I'm, I'm just going to share one or two key things from here, which is that the current population of de the population density of Mumbai is already 10 times that of New York. So that in itself should give you, um, you know, a sort of a picture of how we stay and what is the geographical uh, sort of distribution of people across, uh, especially when it comes to resource allocation as well. Uh, the other point which I want to pick from here is uh, regarding the children in this in this home scenario. So when we're talking about urban poor or the urban population in general, the children especially get very disadvantaged and we'll discuss why. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is just to make a point that the women population also is increasing now in the urban areas. So if you see the previous uh, cross-sectional surveys, which are done usually at a gap of four to five years, uh, we see that men 
then were really dominating it in the urban areas. But now in the NFHS 5, the National Family Health Survey, latest one, men and women ratio is catching up. Next, please. Uh, so when we are talking about the multiple forms of malnutrition, obviously they coexist in India very much. Uh, whether we talk from a global perspective or from an India perspective, we know that poor diets are killing, killing 11 million people worldwide. And a big chunk of this comes from about 60 to 70% comes from low middle income countries such as India. And when we actually, uh, you know, sort of calculated this, Somya Swaminathan and, and PHFI, my previous organization, we did an, a detailed analysis and we found that about 68% of, of our total under five deaths were attributable to malnutrition. So please bear in mind this, this number, which is, this is really um, put together uh, in, in terms of AIDS, malaria, and TB combined, uh, this number exceeds that. Next, please. Uh, the other fact which we should be concerned in India is the, the rising epidemic of obesity. This is just a pap just paper in Lancet released, uh, I think, five days or less than a week ago, which clearly outlines, look at the jump from or women. If I just pick up women, 2.4% of women in India were, uh, if a million people, women in India in 1990 were obese. And look at that number now. It's 44 million. The jump is multifold. And... and it's much, much more than what the world is going through on an average. So the India story really needs to be watched carefully and, and acted upon very, very urgently when it comes to NCD risk factors like obesity. Next, please. Uh, I can think I skip this. Uh, this is also again burden, which we've uh, sort of discussed a lot about. Next, please. This is one chart, one of the papers, again, from in, in ICMR India, in Diab study, which illustrated the risk factors amongst Indians by geographical distribution of rural and urban. And if you see abdominal obesity is one marker I've picked up. There are several there, okay? Whether it's uh, blood pressure, whether it's triglycerides, there are so many. So abdominal obesity, if you see India as a whole, yes, it is uh, it is alarming. But if you look at the urban side, urban side which is uh, more than 25%, the complete urban population is having for abdominal obesity as a risk factor. So it's really, really telling when it comes to urban problems, particularly. Next, please. And, and this chart here by Jessica Fanzo and group from the HLPE, the high-level panel of experts, is essentially to tell you that this is not an individual problem. We must, when we talk about problems in malnutrition, talking about food systems and food environments at a big piece. Uh, and this food system and food environment nexus does have personal filters, whether it's economic, cognitive, aspirational, or situational. But the outcomes of nutrition and health have several drivers also playing their part, which are up in the gray uh, area. And some of these I would touch upon in my talk, uh, because we don't have too much time to go into uh, the framework analysis, but we will definitely see some data coming, coming on all of this. All of this. Next, please. So, of course, nutrition transition has been happening, but it's at an unprecedented pace in India. And these kind of pictures, which, which sort of tell you the modern life, uh, where you have all the intention to, to work out or, or invest in gyms or live the, the ultra-cool elite life, but, but the behavior change aspect also needs to club uh, along with the policy initiatives. So this is just as because diets are a matter of choice many times we say, but we forget that they are also conditioned due to markets and so on and so forth. So just to make that point here. Next, please. Uh, this chart was very interesting to me because this is a paper in Nature where, where the Indian authors have actually delineated uh, 124 commodities and they have studied how urban and rural people are making their choices. And very clearly, because Stuart was, when we were uh, developing this, this uh, PowerPoint, then uh, I, Stuart gave us some suggestions in terms of showcasing the, the urban rural differences. And this to me was very telling because the choice of cereals, like the breads, the more processed foods are being consumed in urban areas, as you will imagine. But then the rural people also are catching up in several of the bad, uh, you know, sort of trends in, in some ways. And there are still some practices, the traditional practices, by and large, uh, which are getting reflected here, uh, which the urban people, due to urbanization, even if they were rural people but have urbanized, uh, are losing. And therefore, this whole slurry of, of metabolic risk factors creeping in. So this chart and this paper is, is I invite all of you to, to go through this in detail. Uh, 
uh, but largely to give you a picture of the urban rural differences in each of the food items that are listed over here, whether it's uh, you know mustard oil being consumed in rural India more, the beverages being consumed, the Coca-Colas and, and all not whatnots uh, in urban packaged foods, and as high as 300% difference in urban and rural um, you know, sort of intakes is, is mapped. Next, please. Uh, again, this is a paper uh, which was interesting, I thought, uh, from the IFPRI colleagues, where they actually compared the Indian diet with the Eat Lancet diet, because the aspect of planetary health, of sustainable food choices, is also very crucial these days. And, and therefore, when we see this chart, again, by urban rural uh, differences, you will clearly find that Indian diet is not matching up to Eat Lancet at all, except in the richest 10% of urban and rural families, and that too only for fruits. Uh, other than that, whether it's, uh, you know, the poorest, uh, the north-south, the region-wise, everything is way below. It's all in negative. That those are percentages of, of food, fruits and vegetables, which is the most healthy. We count them as most healthy here. So therefore, that's the gap that Indian people are, are having in their diets right now. Next, please. Uh, this is just to make the point that we've started eating out a lot. Look at the numbers here on the right, where the market for uh, eating out or takeaways has rapidly, rapidly increased. Uh, we can't even, like, you know, 390,000 restaurant partners, 128,000 by Swiggy. These are just two big names in India, but I'm sure there are so many more which are doing it at a local mode or, you know, like sort of sub granular level uh, as well. And the Euro Monitor also says that this market of fast food is growing rapidly. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Uh, another challenge which complicates this whole uh, conglomerate of, of already described risk factors is the climate change, which is, you know, we've sleepwalked into a new global health emergency. And we know uh, from our own data and from Sam Meyer's group, for example, the Planetary Health Association in, in Boston, uh, they have worked and shown, uh, along with our group at PHFI, uh, that the crop yields, both in quality and in quantity, are going down because of climate change. The important micronutrients like iron, zinc, uh, you know, so many of these uh, important things are actually uh, decreased to up to 30% decrease um, in fruits and vegetables and cereals, uh, protein sources, and so on and so forth. Next, please. Uh, this is just a snapshot of all the government programs which exist. So nutrition is taken very seriously by, by the Indian government. Uh, at least uh, all the programs across the life course are, are listed here. Uh, right from the womb to the tomb, we say, uh, nutrition is uh, prioritized uh, as per the government mandate. And there are several programs for, especially for the urban people or for the poor people, uh, because this government is seen to be pro poor. So a lot of free rations, a lot of uh, THR take home rations, uh, midday meal schemes, um, you know, some kind of food supplements uh, for our children, for our pregnant women, for our lactating women are also being distributed. Uh, next, please. And one such instance, one such thing which I would want to talk about is the National Food Security Act, because this is a landmark, uh, you know, Food Security Act. The amount, the magnitude of this, the coverage of this is, is expansive. This was uh, uh, launched in 2013, and it basically was trying to make a paradigm shift in the approach where from a welfare perspective, we actually moved on to a right-based approach uh, for food systems and food security. So this uh, act enables not only 75% of rural population, but also 50% of urban population to receive subsidized grains through the targeted PDS, the public distribution system. Um, two thirds of the population covered under this act actually receives this. Uh, the prime minister after COVID has been giving this to extended families as well. 80, 80 million uh, families uh, in India are getting rations, free rations under this act. Next please. So one of the pieces that we, uh, Dr. Reddy and I were, were working on when I was leaving PHFI was look at food environment and what are possible Indian solutions. Uh, and the first which comes to our mind is obviously make the healthier foods, uh, you know, cheaper and the uh, unhealthy HFSS foods uh, more expensive. And so these economic measures, and it's not that we are not that there are several taxation and finance committees now being orchestrated by the government itself and also by Niti Aayog, which are looking at different aspects of how do we increase the GST or decrease it and so on and so forth. 
but this is an area I thought could be more nuanced uh, in order to influence the food environments also for urban work, um, and for urban populations in general uh, more positively. The second is about public finance programs, the ones like I was mentioning, whether it's PDS, whether it's Mitte Meal, Porsche, uh, uh, Porsche uh, But what about prison? What about railways? What about urban poor slum dwellers? These are also large chunk of populations which sometimes slip through the cracks. So a more comprehensive policy on, on improving the existing financed, uh, public finance programs should also be thought about. The third is about marketing and promotion. And there are several, again, uh, agencies which are working through this. But like we said before, uh, certain organizations like the FSSAI in this case requires a more robust, more uh, teething, uh, like a, a more powerful role in terms of being able to control the market and promoting of, of high quality diets. Reformulation, labeling, processing in the same way. Uh, what about mobile vendors in India? Because there's a huge chunk of informal sector where you do not have all these rules and regulations or certifications working out. So how do we bring them in the fold? Uh, the food supply chains, maximizing entry points for nutrition. You know, how do we, we think about the climate smart agriculture? Uh, these are certain things. It's not that when I'm putting these questions, nothing is being done. People are coming up, there are startups, there are ways by which different uh, departments are working together. But there is a lot more and lot um, more quality, both in quantity and quality, which requires to be done. Uh, also promoting accessibility to high quality foods at different big, like hospitals, airports. Uh, we don't even get a good meal, a decent meal, which is not HFSS at these places. And uh, one P which we have is about better disaggregated data. I, I was looking hard to find urban uh, you know, section that I had to do. So we do not have this at the national level being collected, uh, being shared, uh, people talking this at forums. We, we usually take this as, as two or three chunks, but not having granular, uh, better disaggregated data on food quality environments is something which, which prevents researchers like us uh, to be able to contribute um, meaningfully. Next, please. That said, uh, I would like to summarize that Maybe the malnutrition burden is massive, yes, but the diets which we are consuming are major contributors to this. And these diets come from the food environment and food systems. So it's not just an individual problem. The main message is to look at the, the spectrum across the board uh, with all the actors in play. The second is about environmental impacts. I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that the environmental impacts cannot be out of the nutrition domain. It's not for the environmentalists or the agriculturists to talk about this. Nutrition people need to care up and, you know, and take charge of this. This is a very, very important. It's affecting foods and diets. The third about policy actions, the global goals that we set, whether it's SDGs, whether it's um, you know the, the targets that we, we sort of make uh, for ourselves at the country level, these need to be seeing a more holistic picture or a roadmap of how do we achieve this. So uh, what are the ways by which value chains, the food policies can span across? How can you increase consumer demand or nudge it in a positive way are also questions that we must uh, be able to answer more, more comprehensively. Another one is about integrated approaches or composite approaches, as in this case, or regulatory, fiscal, voluntary, and other approaches are also important. Just by subsidizing, maybe it's not important. Maybe in addition to it, nudging the demand, the behavior change communication, then also making sure that those, those items are available in the A-line shops uh, for the person to, to go and buy. All those things together is, is very important. Consumption matters, sustainable, healthy diets. And I think one point to start with is schools or at least the Anganwadi centers or the, the government setups or uh, the private and public schools because the children need to be sensitized about this. I think they can be a very good uh, source for, for uh, you know, amplifying the message. And like I was saying in the previous slide, lack of evidence uh, is there, but that should not be an excuse for inaction. We know enough also to be able to spur some good and positive action. Uh, and action generates evidence also. So therefore, it, it, it cannot be just a blame game, and we all need to contribute in this together. And last but not the least, I think a whole food systems approach is needed. While there are health and environmental win-wins for, you know, and there can be trade-offs too, but it's important to see this 
uh, with the collective vision of all stakeholders to be able to address whether it's urban, whether it's rural, whether it's policy at large. So there are several initiatives which, which are looking at a whole system foods approach now. And one of them, which I know from a free, uh, from Ulema Menon's group is the TAFSA, uh, the, the Transforming Agriculture uh, Support System and Sustainable Diets, uh, looking at Southeast Asia. With that, I, I know I, I may have exceeded time, Stuart, so I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Shweta. That was excellent. Um, just so much uh, fascinating insight into the evolution, the change in the nutrition situation in India. I was 40 years ago that I arrived in India um, to spend two years working there, and I was looking purely at undernutrition to see the, the, the way that the profile has changed over that, those four decades. And it accelerated the issues of obesity and overweight. And I really like some of the points you made at the end, especially about the issue of lack of evidence not being an excuse. We have a similar thing at the moment in the UK, where the government are failing to do anything. They keep saying we need more evidence, we need more evidence. And it's a classic situation. Where, and as you say, with that, with action, you do get evidence. You get more experience and you start to learn more about the situation. So excellent. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we will move uh, straight on to uh, Nick, Nick, uh, Dr. Nick Rose. Uh, Nick is a senior lecturer in food studies at the William Anglis Institute and the co-founder and executive director of Sustain, the Australian Food Network. So over to you, uh, Nick, for your perspective. Thank you. Thank, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Stuart. Just checking that my sound is coming through okay? Yeah, that sounds yep. fine. Okay, terrific. All right, thanks very much. So, uh, good morning, uh, I guess, for the for the UK and afternoon for other regions, and, and good evening uh, for anyone joining from Australia. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this webinar. And congratulations on the work of the Food Foundation and the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, and colleagues on the panel who've presented. Uh, as we've heard, uh, this is an incredibly uh, vital, urgent and important topic. And I was really impressed by the food justice toolkit that the city of Birmingham has developed and launched. And I think there's there's so much to commend that approach, uh, which is what I'm going to discuss over the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, before I do so, just a couple of preliminary uh, matters. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the First Nations people of the land on which I live and work. That's the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong peoples of the Kulu Nation. They are the traditional owners of the land now known as Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. And I acknowledge that sovereignty of this land has not been ceded. Uh, so myself and my colleagues pay respect to their ancestors and elders who always have and always will care for country and community today and for future generations. And also, as we're talking about food justice, uh, I want to make clear my strong condemnation of the genocide being perpetrated as we speak on the people of Gaza by is the Israeli government and army, including the deliberate engineering of a famine that is now causing death by starvation of growing numbers of children. I also condemn, uh, condemn unreservedly the complicity of the Australian government in these horrendous crimes against humanity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for those who haven't heard of Sustain, we are one of Australia's leading healthy and sustainable food systems organisations. We champion tradition, the transition rather to healthy, socially just, sustainable food systems. Um, we bring diverse actors together around a shared agenda for change, align mutually reinforcing activities and harness energy and enthusiasm for food systems transformation. And a key element of our work is to champion the sustainable urban agriculture sector and maintain exemplar food justice farms as proof of practice. Next slide. So I just want to uh, spend a, a couple of slides talking about conceptual questions and what do we mean by food justice, because it's not a common approach in Australia, uh, much more common is food relief, indeed emergency food relief, uh, but increasingly food security, but food justice really isn't spoken about that much. Um, so food justice, uh, my uh, take on it is that it has its roots in the environmental justice movement, particularly coming out of the United States, which since the 1980s has emphasized the disproportionate board burden borne by low income communities and communities of color through environmentally harmful industries and activities. 
In practical and policy terms, environmental justice had two key areas of focus, first on protection from environmental pollution, and secondly, on procedural justice, that is equal access to spaces of environmental decision-making. Alkin and Argyman in their 2011 text say that food justice follows a similar approach by prioritizing first universal access to healthy food, and secondly, food sovereignty defined as a community's right to define their own food and agricultural systems rather than have those systems decided and designed for them by big corporations and powerful governments. The Birmingham Food Justice Toolkit likewise emphasizes the need to confront the systemic roots of inequality within our food systems and the need for a systemic transformation rather than individual adjustments. And I wholeheartedly agree with that approach. So food justice uh, for me is thus a radical proposal and an agenda for action calling for, to quote Charles Levko and colleagues in that 2020 article, theory, action, and critical reflection about political, social, economic, and environmental resistance to dominant corporate industrial food systems along with racist, patriarchal, and settler colonial logics. Next slide, please. So the conventional policy approach at global and national levels has largely been on food security, which has been less politically contentious than food justice. However, the expansion of the definition of food security in 2020, as we see here, to include the pillars of agency and sustainability represents, in my view, an important shift. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Clapp, one of the members of the HLP, uh, commenting on this in 2022, said that four interlocking policy shifts are required to support all these six dimensions of food security. And I'm just going to read the first one. She says, uh, it needs, it requires policies that support radical transformations of food systems to make them more empowering, equitable, sustainable, and productive. This includes measures to promote equity and the right to food, especially for the most vulnerable and marginalized members of society. It also includes measures to promote more sustainable food system practices, including agroecology to address climate change and ecosystem degradation, uh, as well as more territorial markets to address uneven trade, concentrated markets and persistent inequalities facing food systems. Next slide, please. So the important, uh, if you could click again, please, sorry. Yeah, thank you. So the important point to note here is that this expanded definition of food security is shifting attention towards systems, policy and governance, as well as calling for more participatory processes. So I would argue that with this articulation of agency as an additional pillar of food security, the concept of food security is being broadened and I would say moving more towards the direction of food justice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and if you could click again, sorry, it's just a transition bit in the slide animations. No, uh, the other way. Um, oh, sorry. If you're able to go to the next slide and just click, or if, we, we, or if you want me to share the screen, I could do that. <clears throat> we can share that, just um, do that. Now, does that come through? Okay. See that? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's easier. Sorry. We'll just have to leave it like this. That's okay. Yeah, that's that's easy. That's easier. Yeah, that's fine. So in Australia, um, as those statistics and these are pre-pandemic statistics. Um, food insecurity. I mean, there's a there's a perception of Australia as a, a wealthy country. Uh, we export uh, two thirds of the food we actually produce, and the comfortable assumption is that we don't have a problem with food insecurity in Australia. Uh, however, uh, the uh, the household level and community level analysis actually exposes that as absolutely incorrect. And in fact, uh, food insecurity at that level has been increasing uh, rapidly in in recent years. Um, and in different ways, and the evidence from the food relief agencies and charities is that um, we have uh, new cohorts of people seeking food relief, more frequent requests for food relief, 
uh, more severe levels of food insecurity and people presenting with more complex needs. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of drivers of, uh, of food insecurity, there are several. Um, however, in, a, in, in Australia in particular, the underlying driver or cause of food insecurity uh, and indeed of food injustice, food poverty, is the question of money and financial resources and not having access to sufficient income to purchase food in a socially acceptable manner. Um, so next slide, please. So one of the measures that the Australian government adopted during the first year of the pandemic was to effectively double the rate of income support, uh, job keeper, the payment is called, uh, for a period of six months in, in 2020 to uh, support uh, people who'd lost work or were otherwise vulnerable. Um, and that made a huge difference. As you can see there, uh, through this survey conducted by the Australian Council on Social Services, 83% uh, of those surveyed said they ate better and more regularly, and 93% said they could afford more fresh fruit and vegetables. So a, a huge impact from a, uh, a food justice and dignified food security perspective. Next slide, please. And then uh, that policy was reversed. Uh, that uh, income supplement was taken away. And here we are um, in 2023 uh, with a similar survey. And you can see there uh, now in a, a cost of living crisis, uh, huge increase on uh, pressures on family budgets through uh, interest rate rises, uh, rental increases, housing increases, uh, food price inflation, and the uh, impacts on food security are, are very evident. Next slide, please. Um, it's also important, um, this is, uh, you see the, the, the citation of this article in BMC Public Health, um, important to emphasise that First Nations people in Australia uh, have historically and continue to experience higher levels of food insecurity than the non-Indigenous population, and this is a continuing and unresolved legacy of colonisation. Um, uh, and there are five, as that, that box shows, five core areas impacting uh, food security for uh, First Nations um, First Nations peoples in this country. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so just starting to wrap up now by looking at some of the responses um, to this uh, issue, both at the policy level and uh, at the uh, community level. If we can... Yep, so... Um, in terms of policies, uh, we heard from Filippo earlier about the city of Melbourne as one of two Australian cities that are signatories to the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. So they've done um, a considerable amount of work in this area. The community food relief plan there, as you see there, which Filippo spoke to, uh, is an important initiative. Um, more recently, they've just done a big update of their food policy and sustained work with them in uh, doing a, a refresh of that food policy and engaging with over 100 stakeholders. And it's out, in fact, it closes uh, this week for public consultation. And one of the core themes in the new food policy for the City of Melbourne is actually on food justice. So we've actually written that into the new food policy. Um, also, uh, Tasmania at a state government level uh, has a food relief to food resilience action plan, um, 2023 to 2025. So that's at the, the state government level, which is, uh, which is significant. Um, and then the, on the right-hand side, these are parliamentary inquiries that have been uh, reporting recently. So the New South Wales one, um, a, a statewide uh, inquiry in Parliament uh, in 2022 um, that, amongst other things, called for a whole-of-state uh, food security plan and a statewide food council to oversee that with representation from First Nations and other stakeholders across the food system in New South Wales. Um, the New South Wales government is due to respond to that uh, inquiry uh, imminently. And then at the top, um, it's our federal parliament, the House Standing Committee on Agriculture conducted a national inquiry into food security uh, last year and reported shortly um, before Christmas um, with that report, uh, Australian Food Story Feeding the Nation and Beyond, which again called for a whole of country national food security plan, a minister for food 
a, a national food council to uh, guide the implementation of that plan and and many other recommendations. So, um, you know, some of these messages are actually getting through to politicians. Again, the government has to give its response and we'll see what that looks like uh, in a couple of months. And then the final slide, just to speak at the community level, the kinds of things that are taking place. So these are, you know, just, just three examples of hundreds, if not thousands of similar initiatives that are taking place all around this country. Um, the bottom right-hand corner of the community grocer is a weekly affordable food market and a not-for-profit organization that's funded by philanthropy. Uh, does pop up um, fresh food markets for people in low income housing estates. Um, uh, in 2022, they were serving 200 customers every week. 42% um, of their low income customers uh, were experiencing food insecurity. And as a result of community grocers' work, 62% uh, said they had increased their vegetable consumption and 91% felt more connected to their community. Uh, the photo above them are the uh, founders of the United African Farm. This is a land-based food justice initiative led by refugees and migrants from uh, different African backgrounds who've settled in Australia in the last uh, several years, many coming from agricultural backgrounds. And they, uh, with our support and the support of others, were able to enter into a land-sharing arrangement with a local third-generation beef farmer on the outskirts of Melbourne to grow cultural food crops and... Uh, they received a $450,000 grant from our Health Promotion Foundation to uh, continue that work and expand it into a food hub. And then on the left-hand side there, those uh, growing boxes, um, myself and my colleagues and with some visitors from the State Department of Health at the Oak Hill Food Justice Farm in Preston, uh, which is on 800 square metres of what was derelict and abandoned land owned by the Anglican Church in, in Melbourne. And uh, with the support of the local government, Darabin City Council, uh, we negotiated a, a peppercorn license to turn that land into a, uh, a food justice farm, partnering with a local food relief agency, agency and growing, as you can see there, fresh herbs and vegetables to support uh, 150 families uh, in need uh, with access to healthy, uh, fresh, nutrient-dense uh, food. Um, and we've also, with our funding, uh, run um, uh, short uh, paid internships for young people experiencing barriers to further education and employment, as well as partnering with primary schools through a hands-on learning program and, uh, and much more. Uh, so it's really trying to demonstrate uh, with funding and resourcing and a vision and a plan, the kinds of uh, positive benefits that can be achieved through activating a, a small space like that. And our vision and our demand from our governments is that we need one of, you know, we need places like this right throughout our cities and our country uh, to address critical food needs and um, uh, make our, you know, make our country more resilient in the face of uh, climate change and, you know, and the challenges and crises that we're facing. So I'll finish there, Stuart. Um, thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, Nick. Another excellent presentation. So much uh, fascinating content. I really like the way you reminded us of the extension of the food security concept to include agency and sustainability, moving it more towards the, the concept of food justice, which was really important. Also your emphasis uh, on the crucial issue and the challenge of uh, First Nations food justice. Um, and the big question about what we talk about when we talk about food systems, is it reform or repair or is it transformation? What is transformation? And I think that applies obviously beyond the urban context. Uh, we, we, we have a situation of corporate capture of food systems, which uh, is anathema to justice. And uh, we'll, well, we'll get onto that hopefully in the discussion. But uh, thanks again. Um, and we just to remind you, please put your questions. There are nobody, very shy audience. Nobody is asking any questions at the moment, but there is the option there in the Q&A button. Please drop your questions in there. Uh, we'll move on now to hear from Leticia Petrovich of the Food Foundation. Letitia will introduce the uh, Food Justice Toolkit that we and the Birmingham uh, City Council and Food Foundation and MEFBP were involved in developing over the last uh, year or so. Uh, over to you, Letitia. Thanks, Stuart. <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep this brief so we can keep some time for the Q&A as well. <clears throat> so um, if I just share my screen, hopefully this won't fail me this time. Um, okay. 
So I'll share the links to all of this um, afterwards, but um, essentially what we did in addition to the Global Food Justice Pledge, we've developed um, a food justice intervention database where we looked at the kind of how we can build the resources to support the Food Justice Pledge. So we developed a database of interventions, policies and strategies that have been implemented worldwide and that will hopefully help policymakers um, navigate challenges and maximize those positive outcomes when they think about interventions in their localities. So the way that we've organized the Food Justice Toolkit is um, we've essentially divided it across five different thematic sections that closely align with the Milan Pact Framework for Action. So looking at interventions across governance, social and economic equity, food production, food supply and distribution, food waste and recycling. And each of these um, sections essentially has a high level description of this theme. What are the key concepts, principles and goals? Um, what are the potential uh, target populations for different interventions? And in which settings have they been successful and what are some of those facilitators and challenges that have been encountered in implementing those interventions. So for each of the sections, you, if you click on it. Um, so if I click on social and economic equity, for example, you'll be able to find um, those key uh, themes and, and uh, sub themes. And then within the uh, systematic review section, you'll be able to actually download the full database, uh, which I have already downloaded. So if I pick that up here, it should hopefully show up on your screen. So at the moment it's in a, a big an Excel spreadsheet. We're hoping that uh, for the future phases, we might be able to make it into an app so it's more, more easily navigatable. But essentially, once you open it, you'll see all of the different sub themes that we've identified for the social economic equity theme. And then for each of those sub themes, you'll be able to filter by your region. So uh, in this instance, we could read, we could filter in Asia, for example, and then you'll be able to see uh, in which country the intervention was uh, implemented, what's the country economy, whether it's low, lower middle income country or high income country, what's the city and area, and you'll be able to filter by all of these um, columns. There's also a short description of intervention and uh, where it was implemented who the target population was and then what the impact was in terms of tackling food insecurity and any other um, positive follow-up outcomes. And you'll also be able to find a link to the study that we've um, pulled this from and any additional uh, links to that intervention that whether it's been referenced in any government papers or action plans uh, you'll be able to find that. And that is available for all of the themes that uh, you can filter on uh, here. So for each of these, you'll be able to download the full database and also have the summary on here on some of the um, key challenges and facilitators for successful interventions in this uh, area, as well as uh, if there was any kind of systematic review of whether those interventions work and how effective they are in tackling food injustice. So um, we're hoping that you will also use that within your localities and are able to also enrich it with any of the interventions and um, your own kind of experience and case studies. So if you would like to share that with us, please uh, do get in touch. I'll pop the link into the chat where you can get in touch with the team at Birmingham City Council who will be happy to um, essentially update and, and showcase some of those interventions as well that you have done in, in your cities and in your localities. And um, just lastly, in addition, we've also um, developed the self-assessment tool, which uh, you can, if I reshare my screen briefly, I'll be able to show you where you can find that. So if you click um, to the Global Food Justice Pledge self-assessment tool, you'll be able to download a spreadsheet which will then allow you to assess your localities and um, strengths and weaknesses across a number of different 
categories and themes that um, align with the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact Framework for Action. So hopefully this will also be useful, but if you have any comments or feedback on that, please do uh, let us know. And we're looking to update that in the coming months as well. So I'll stop sharing. It's never easy to do the live demo online, but hopefully people will- well, you did. You did it, it very well. <laughs> um, Letitia, just remind us, how do we find it again? Uh, we you, you'd search Food Foundation. Um, uh, I'll just pop all of the yeah, I'll just put all of the links. Uh, it's on the Birmingham City Council's website, so uh, you should be able to directly right. access it here. But if Perfect. you also just type yeah, yeah. Global Food Justice Toolkit, it's usually the first thing that pops up in Google search. Great, yeah. So please search for that, and uh, yeah, any any feedback as well would be important. Uh, that's we hope uh, to to become a living resource that would be in the future updated. So thank you everyone, all the panel for your interventions and, and insight. Uh, we now have about uh, nine minutes for Q and A uh, for the anyone in the entire panel to respond to. We have a couple of interesting questions. I'm going to ask one, uh, which I think is a big issue and a big challenge. Uh, the question coming in from Nanang, Nanang Sulkar Nayan. And it's really, we've talked about uh, food justice largely from an urban perspective. Um, and uh, urban contexts and situations have certain advantages and certain disadvantages with regard to action, policy programs, interventions. The question is, how do we start to take on the issue of food justice from a national or a government perspective? Um, and uh, how do we make that issue of the scale, uh, bring the issue of scale to the centre uh, and enable uh, governments not only to consider, let's say, food security, but food justice, which, which demands a focus on inequality and injustice and addressing the disadvantage and marginalisation of certain communities. So I, I would be glad to hear from anybody. If you want to put your hand up, you can do that on screen. Actually, you can all put your screens on think would be uh, it's going to be fine and then uh, please anybody anybody who would like to respond to that question about scaling up to okay we have Nick so we'll go to Nick scaling up to a national perspective I, I think a really great example I guess, excellent question I think a, good, a really good example is Brazil um, with its zero hunger strategy um, from the I think the first Lula government uh, with the workers party and uh, what was what was done and achieved there, and the way that was designed and implemented, uh, and had excellent results in you know in certain places, uh, particularly Belo Horizonte, I think was like a really standout city in in uh, it was halving the rate of child malnutrition in ten years, and I think that just showed with national coordination and strong focus leadership at the local level and implementation and commitment of adequate resources and mobilizing. Everybody involved in the food system around that United Vision, you know, things can be turned around very, very quickly. Yeah. Great, thanks, Nick. Anybody else would like to chip in with thoughts on that? So, uh, Shweta, yeah, please. So, I, in terms of scaling up, what I think from an Indian perspective, what has worked is demonstrated convergent joint accountability operations. So it's very important. So if I unpack that, so for example, there is a, uh, for WCD, the Women and Child Development Ministry here, when they look after the nutrition of, of vulnerable populations, especially pregnant and lactating women and children, what they are trying to have a flagship program is under the umbrella of Ocean, which brings in health, it brings in wash elements, it brings in Ministry of Rural Development, you know, so many other, and agriculture. So and environment, all these ministries have task forces which bring in their, their respective experiences and how they are going to win out of this. So you know, to, to have the shared bit of pie, I think that makes it attractive for the governments to pitch in and send people regularly. So that's been an experiment here. It's still underway, but that's something which I think is useful. Great. Thank you, Shweta. Any, any other thoughts on the issue of Moving from urban to government, okay, nobody. Actually, that uh, what you mentioned there, um, Nick in Brazil was fascinating. You have Lula uh, coming in again 20 years after he came in the first time. And the Zero Hunger Programme, it's interesting in the new version of it, 
pr brings in a much stronger focus on quality of the diet, not just calories. Uh, that's one part. Another part is uh, a, a sort of a deep rooted sort of focus on uh, engagement and, and inclusion and, and demand so that any future right wing populist government would not be able to so easily overturn it. So I think there's, um, yeah, it's an interesting story around that 20 years gap uh, from mm. the, the, the launch of the first and, and the second. But yeah, thanks. Um, uh, let's have a look. I'm looking at questions. Uh, there's a question here again from Nanang. How do we understand the term food justice in the case of, uh, well, the war situation in Gaza? Um, that's, uh, yeah, uh, any... Uh, Nick's got his hand up there. Nick, go over to you. Well, I mean, I think uh, it's a situation of complete injustice. What's what's happening there? You know, a, 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 a human-made catastrophe and quite intentional siege where uh, food is being blockaded from from Gaza. Um, so, I think you know the, the 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 response from a food justice perspective would be to um, you know, to, to remedy that situation, we've seen action attempted by South Africa, for example, in the International Court of Justice, uh, invoking their obligations under the Genocide Convention. I mean, that that should be the response of the international community to uh, use the mechanisms and the legal framework that was created un, in, under the United Nations uh, and with the, uh, particularly with the, you know, the Genocide Convention. Uh, but it hasn't it hasn't worked, and that's a uh, you know that that's a, a a very dangerous situation for the whole uh, system of international law and international human rights. That uh, um, you know that that that, that a, a court can give the judgment as it did, and the case can be put, and it's very compelling in my view, and yet it's completely ignored. So it's um it's a it's a serious challenge for the whole system of global governance. I think that that entire situation, unfortunately. Thank you. Yeah, agreed. Um, any other thoughts? Uh, we we have a few minutes. I can't see any more questions. We have a few minutes. Anybody on the panel who would like to conclude or say uh, wrap up or, or raise questions even for the future? Um, as you're thinking of that, I'll just say a few things. I think I think the uh, the great thing about this series of webinars is obviously the, the, the variety and diversity of experience across different regions, which we've seen over, over the last few months, um, but also the commonality. Uh, some of it, you know, it's interesting actually, Nick, looking at your, the last slide you showed on linking and comparing that to Karen Washington, uh, who's a food justice activist in, in Brooklyn, in New York, and her work, and a very similar set of photos of urban, uh, food justice and and and, and kitchen and gardens, community gardens. Uh, so that that was kind of interesting. But uh, there are lots of examples of that commonalities. And I think if we one big challenge, I think, is the networking aspect. Now, MUFPP is fantastic that network and I and extending that across across the world, but also taking on board lessons about scale and and linking in with national to try and show what can be done and 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 demand better action on the part of, of national uh, so-called leaders uh, is, is a big part of that challenge. And it's fundamentally an issue of human rights uh, and, uh, and an issue of equity. That we yeah, I, I just, just might, might just add um, that one of the big questions in the inequity of the food system is the, and, and um, uh, IPS Food, International Panel of Experts on Sustainable yeah. Food Systems have written extensively about this, is the the corporate concentration of power in the food system and who's actually making, you know, the, the big decisions about what's produced and how it's distributed and the price that farmers get and, you know, the terms on which trade is conducted and so on. Um, you know, holding those corporations to account is critical in terms of achieving global food justice, in my view. Um, there's an interesting attempt to do that in Australia currently with our supermarkets. We've got an incredibly concentrated supermarket sector with two companies, uh, Coles and Woolworths, that hold... 70 to 75 percent of the retail grocery market and that translates to you know a, a big crush on prices for farmers and also allegations of price gouging in the current context um hurting consumers so you know that's now there's an inquiry into that we've been here before in 2008 and nothing was really done so it'll be a real test for our uh, competition framework and regulatory system to see if anything can actually 
be done to address that you know huge concentration of market power in the Australian supermarket um, context. Great, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, any other uh, thoughts from anyone at this point? We, did I hear somebody? First, Kendi, I think. That's right. Did you have a thought? Yeah, so I, I thought I, I would wait to see if Kendi and, and Filippo were doing it, but that's okay. So I was thinking more about two issues, which we did not, I think, touch, it on, touch a lot about in this presentation, was food wastage. Um, I think it's a big, big deal in in areas and contexts uh, with the climate change coming in, with lots of um, you know supply chain issues happening. I think the food wastage is also something which we have to think about collectively. And the second thing is about governance, uh, especially like I was saying that there is convergence happening and this and that. But still, I feel nutrition is very, um, you know, which is a good thing though that it inputs into a lot of sectors and therefore sometimes it's left as, a, left as a child which doesn't have real parents to go to. Where does it house? You know, where does it actually the ownership lies? Uh, with whom? If it doesn't move forward, the, all the ideas that we discussed, if it doesn't happen to reality, who's accountable? So that is a big question for us many times. So fixing the accountability of nutrition is, is not that simple and straightforward. There are so many sectors like we were discussing. And how do we actually think about this in a more comprehensive fashion is uh, in, in, in that first attempt uh, to answer that question of, of scalability to governments. I think this is something which we grapple with even in my last 20 years of, of work. I think this is one question which repeatedly comes in different forums. So um, I don't know if I do have answers, but these are questions I would like to raise through you, uh, that governance, accountability, as well as food wastage. Yeah. Right. Great. Thank you, Shweta. OK, we are time is up. I wonder if there are any last thoughts from Filippo or uh, for MUFPP or Leticia from Food Foundation. Uh, any? Thoughts, Leticia? Yeah, I would just like to thank everyone. It's been um, such a, an amazing opportunity to get to know so many cities and representatives from MUFPP, experts and panelists. And um, I think one of the things that we want this, even though obviously the fellowship is coming to an end this year, we want to continue having this conversation and collaborating. Birmingham has previously hosted the Food Futures event in 2022, where we brought um, a lot of our Commonwealth during the Commonwealth Games, we've got a lot of Commonwealth city representatives to talk about food system transformation and, and we hope that um, in the future there will be more opportunities to continue this conversation. So um, I would very much encourage everyone to stay in touch and, and um, do use the resources that we presented and we would like to this to be a living resource. So um, in a year or two times to revisit kind of where we are and the progress that's been made. Great, excellent, thank you. Uh, Filippo, any thoughts? or? I don't know if you're there. I see you now. Yes, oh, yes. Just, just, just one immediate reaction. So I also share the the governance part is fundamental, and indeed it's the uh, the first category, let's say, of the Milan Pact. It's the way that uh, we uh, like urban food system. Uh, uh, can interact with, uh, for example, the regional and the, the different level of governments, like the national legislation and the regional legislation, and uh, also uh, food waste is a is a, is a category in which cities of the Milan Pact are very active, and also in the region that we are discussing today, uh, who, um, the the program uh, enacted by Rurkela has the aim of uh, reducing the uh of an important amount the 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 wastage of uh, healthy food in market so this is also interesting because let's say the majority of the of the of the cities of the milan pact are focusing on uh, uh food waste at a consumption or retailer level but this is in the let's say uh in the in the upper part of the food chain so it, it's something that uh, uh i wanted to to highlight Great, thank you, Felipe, and thanks to everybody, all panelists, all participants in the audience for, for your engagement. Uh, we have come to the end, and we just to say that this will be, I, I think, available online at a later date. And if you if you check on the Food Foundation website, there will be links 
there. So thank you, everyone. And uh, with that, goodbye. See you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.